G'day. A student called Daniel contacted me via my website and asked for a series of videos about integrating. So Daniel, this is for you and for anyone else who wants to watch this series as well. I'm going to start by dealing with some theoretical issues first and explaining the terminology and symbols that we use and subsequent videos will deal with the practicalities. But first we need to understand something about the fundamental theorem of calculus. This theorem was devised in the 1600s and it helped mathematicians link together two concepts that had existed long before. One was the concept of how to find areas of shapes by dividing them up into little strips which the Greeks had known about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years earlier and the other was how to find gradients and rates uh, of functions. Now this is how it came about. If we imagine that we have some function of x graphed and that is continuous at least over a particular range, uh, a particular domain, let's choose a lower bound of a a lower boundary there and let's choose an upper boundary and just call it X. We're going to discuss first of all the area under the curve and we're going to give this a function name capital A for area. Area is a function of X. You can see of course that if X was equal to A, if this upper boundary came right back to where A was, that the area between the two would be zero. So we could in fact write that the area at A is zero. But of course as X grows, the area grows as well, and the area is a function of X. Now, in order to somehow connect it with limits and differentiation, we then ask the next question. What if we asked what the area would be? Actually, I won't call it dx, I'll just call it h. What would be the area from a all the way up to? particularly wanted to colour this bit in, all the way up to x plus h. Well, you can see that the red area is going to be the area function up to x plus h. So here we have it in black, the area from a up to x under the curve, and in red, the area from a up to x plus h under the curve. So the question now arises, what can we say about this tiny little portion? Well, this little strip here, above the x-axis, between x and x plus h, and below the curve, is going to be this area minus that area. I think you can agree to that. So it's this larger red area, subtract all that black area and we're just left with that strip. Now what can we say about it? Well, we can say that it has two bounds. One is, if we imagine the rectangle that has a height the same as this left hand side of the rectangle, that rectangle will be less than or perhaps equal to the area under the curve if the curve levels off and the height of this is the function value at x. So I'll put f of x there and the width of the strip from x to x plus h is h. So this lower area is fx times h. What if we took this altitude, or this height, on the right hand side is the height of the rectangle. 
we would get an upper bound, an upper rectangle. The height here is the function value at x plus h. Again, the width is still h. So the upper rectangle would have an area of f x plus h times h. Now, you might say we don't know the curve's rising. What if it was dropping? Well, all that would happen is that f of x would be higher and f of x plus h would be lower. So these two would swap positions, but everything else would stay the same. And we'll see uh, in a couple of lines of work that it really doesn't matter. But you can see that the lower rectangle is less than or equal to this area under the curve, which is less than or equal to the upper rectangle. Now, if we divide all of these three by h, divide that by h, we get fx. Divide this by h, we simply have to write it in this form. And divide the h from this, and we're left with f x plus h. And you might recognize this pattern here if you've done differentiation from first principles. What, of course, we're going to do is take the limit as h goes to 0 of this, which means we have to take the limit as h goes to 0 of that, and the limit as h goes to 0 of that. What does that mean on the diagram? Well, it means h is the width of the strip. So we're taking the limit as the strip narrows and narrows microscopically small. Let's see what we get. Well, f of x is not a function of h at all. So taking the limit as h goes to 0, we'll simply leave it as f of x. This limit, as h goes to 0, as h becomes 0, x plus h tends towards x. So this becomes f of x. Isn't that interesting? What is this in the middle? Well, you'll recognise that from differentiation <coughs> by first principles as the derivative of the a function with respect to x. So here we have it, the derivative of the a function lies between these, but these are in fact identical. And they would be whether you swapped these around or not. So therefore, we conclude that if this lies between two identical things, and it must be the same as them, therefore the derivative of the area function is the same as the function of the curve. Or if you like, this is the antiderivative of f. So let's write that down. ax equals the antiderivative of fx. This is the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. To see, in fact, that the area under a curve is the antiderivative of the function. And there we have connected derivatives and areas. So we've discovered that the derivative of the area function is the same as the function of the curve. Let's write our terminology a little bit differently, d by dx of the area function is this function. Now, the purists may not like me. I'm not doing this rigorously, this is for school use and it's to give you a comprehension of it rather than perform a rigorous um, derivation. But dx is a quantity, it can be treated like a quantity, and we can multiply both sides of the equation by this. Now 
and this is in fact a product interestingly what is that product well it's a function value times a little tiny microscopic strip strip of uh, X it's an area length times breadth length times breadth and if we want to add a whole lot of these strips up the same way that the Greeks used to do we sum them now we use terminology that Gottfried Leibniz uh, invented in the 1600s and he used the kind of s the lowercase s that they used to write back then uh, which is different from our s in his day now he spoke German I'm going to write it in English because I speak English uh, in his day if someone wrote the word success for example they would write it this way believe it or not the old-fashioned s looked like this now they used a different s at the end of sentence end of words um, much the same way as Greek Greek for example the number four uh, tesseres T E double S, so the Greek letter S. If you do statistics, you'll understand that is used for standard deviations. T E double S A R E, and there's the S at the end. You can see where we really inherited our S from. But this English, as it was written uh, back in the uh, 1600s, used this long S. So if we sum or add up all of these little areas, this length height times width or length times breadth it's the same as doing this and that is the area under the curve so we understand that the what we now call the integral or the antiderivative of the derivative of the area is the area which is the same as the antiderivative of the function times dx now I'll just see if that, if that disappears fairly quickly like that let's continue we have a slight problem with AX we know it's the antiderivative of F but F has an infinite number of antiderivatives we know that because if we have any function let's choose a simple one like X squared plus 3 and take the derivative we get 2x and the derivative of a constant is 0 that means that if this is the primitive of that so if I do the antiderivative and go back to the original function there's a huge question mark over what constant exists there it could be anything so what we're going to do is say this we know that this area function is the area from A up to X let's imagine we want to find the area from A up to B the terminology that we write based on Leibniz is the area from A to B now some people write the A on this side of the S it doesn't matter uh, or the integral of A to B of FX DX <coughs> pardon me for doing this it's probably doesn't make the board quite so clean but it's a bit faster this the second part of the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus shows that if there is some other primitive function let's call it capital F of X that differs by some constants constant from the area function then we know that because a of a is zero so we can now write I'll actually turn this around we can write this integral
is equal to the area of function at B. I'm going to write minus the area of function at A because it makes no difference. We know that's worth zero. But using this understanding, the area of function at B is going to be FB plus K and the area of function at A is going to be F of A plus K and expanding, removing the parentheses, you can see this will be f of b minus f of a, where f is the primitive or the antiderivative of f. a also is an antiderivative, but we're pointing out the fact that the constant makes no difference. So this is the second theorem, part of the theorem of uh, calculus fundamental theorem of calculus. So it first of all shows that the, the area is the antiderivative of the function and it shows that the value for the area is found by substituting the boundaries or the limits, uh, the boundaries if you like, the boundary values into the primitive function. That will do for this video. There, there's no exercise to do, it's just simply a presentation of the uh, theory behind it and some of the notation we use and I'm going to use this notation I'm going to use this notation as we solve problems over the next few videos if you've enjoyed this video then I encourage you to click on the like button below it if you have comments to make particularly constructive ones then I'd love to read them please add them below as well and finally if you're not already a subscriber then I encourage you to click on the subscribe button and uh, I look forward to bringing you further videos in the not too distant future. Thank you for watching.